The title of Dr. Sosconi's presentation this morning is Sustaining Life on Earth. Welcome, Dr. Sosconi. Yeah. Thanks very much, Chris, and thanks for having me here from the other city, the other big city in Alberta, Edmonton. Um, I also want to acknowledge uh, Ernie Awaschuk and his team for making my participation here possible. Thanks very much. Uh, what I'm going to do this morning in the next 15 minutes is give you uh, a flavor for what I hope to go into more depth in in the uh, concurrent session just after the break. Now, I'm going to be talking at really three different levels, and what I'd like you to keep in mind through the next 15 minutes is the maxim that goes, think, uh, think globally, but act locally. So I'm going to be talking at the micro, the meso, and the macro level of approach to trying to address these global issues. And I'm really coming from the perspective that the world is essentially, from an environmental point of view, a seamless web and what we throw into the Gulf of Mexico ends up in the Arctic. And if you were to bring it to Edmonton, you'd have to dispose of it in Swan Hills because it's a hazardous waste site through environmental transportation. So that's the seamless web that I'm talking about. So the macro level then is looking at the issues from, say, the height of a, a jet flying over the earth or from a satellite. I think it's useful in giving you some sense of where I'm coming from to tell you what an epidemiologist does or what the science of epidemiology is all about. We study where diseases occur, how they are distributed, and the determinants or what causes diseases in populations. And we don't just do this so that we can get a master's or a doctoral thesis out of it. We do it so that we can advise governments to control health, wellness, well-being in populations. So we work on a population level as opposed to a physician who works on a, with a one-on-one -on -one at a micro level with patients. Our job then is to inform policy with a view to reducing harms by preventing disease and premature mortality at the community level. Now we're regarded as the science that bridges toxicologic work, work with animals or petri dishes in labs, to the human experience in the world and uh, we are essentially then the science that is basic to evidence-based policy formulation. Now traditionally in public health we've focused literally for thousands of years with engineers in particular with issues of sanitation, with issues of water quality, food safety and air quality. And more recently over the past couple of hundred years with vaccinations such as smallpox, polio, mumps, rubella, and so on, working on the H1N1 vaccine right now. But now there are new concerns for public health, and very grave concerns, I believe. And this has really been the concern that I've been focusing on out of the University of Alberta for more than the past 15 to 20 years. We've now, as a species, uh, think about it, 100 years ago, there were 1.7 billion people on Earth. 100 years later, We've gone up threefold. We're now at almost 7 billion people on Earth. Every one of these people aspire, aspires to live like we live in Canada, like we live in California, and so on. And what we are hearing from all the different sciences is that the world simply cannot sustain this. We have exceeded the globe's carrying capacity for this number of people, particularly living at this uh, level of consumption. So we've then been tampering with the very fabric of life through the expansion of the human enterprise. And all the services that we take so for granted from nature, whether it's purification of water, providing us with fresh air, soils to grow nutritious crops in, all of these services that we've taken so for granted that we have failed in our economic, in our classical economic modeling to factor into the costing of these products, um, we're now seeing that our support our dependence on these systems is now becoming extremely costly and we cannot any longer take them or, or assume their services free of charge. And the effect in fact of all of these changes is a net negative with global impacts such as climate change, declines in air, water and soil quality globally as well as food security issues globally. 
Many people hear naysayers speak about the issue of climate change and in a major state of denial choose either to ignore the fact that this is a true happening or that it is human induced. Well, we'll come to that certainly in the breakout after the fact, but if you look to the right hand side of this graph in red, this shows you the past 150 or so years since the Industrial Revolution and you can essentially see the dramatic rise in carbon dioxide uh, accumulation in the upper atmosphere. And what this is doing is creating a greenhouse effect. And in fact, we as scientists have been warning and have been warned but since the late 1890s about what's going to happen to this planet and to life on Earth if we allow CO2 levels to continue increasing. In fact, I was in Portugal just this past weekend and had the privilege of meeting Bill McKibben. For those of you who've read environmental literature, he's published quite extensively out of Vermont on the topic of environmental issues. And uh, he's organizing a global campaign on October the 24th called 350. And if you go to www.350.org, you will see that hopefully, certainly in Edmonton, I know there's a group working on it. It's global. It's in every part of the world. You'll see banners trying to embed in our minds this fact that if we exceed 350 parts per million CO2 in the upper atmosphere, we are heading to cataclysmic collapse of life and civilization as we know it. And guess what? We're presently at over 380, increasing at two parts per million. Now all of these changes have grave implications and I can't impress upon you any more the traditional form of epidemiology as I described it to you really focused on more what we call proximate causes of illness. But with these much more upstream and, and more severe effects, I believe that public health and epidemiology in particular has an even more important role to play because I submit what could be more important than presenting the harms to massive, on a massive scale than on harms to, say, a group that works with a particular pesticide, for instance, or a group of people who choose to smoke tobacco products. That certainly is important, but here we're talking about the demise of millions, if not billions, of people, and quite soon. So you see here that contemporary global scale issues uh, have major implications, whether we're talking about global geoclimatic system changes, whether we're talking about the population growth issue that I referred to earlier and the expansion of cities and movement of people into cities, mass and forced voluntary migrations through eco ecological harms and inc increased size of deserts, the expansion of consumption intensive lifestyles, particularly in developing and newly uh, evolving economies in the world such as China and India, increasing global and within country disparities. We know from the French Revolution that as disparities grow, this is a formula for social disruption and revolution. And what do we see happening now under the current economic paradigm is the rich are growing in number and richer, the poor are growing in number and poorer, and the middle class is becoming smaller. This is not a formula for good living now or for long-term living. So I don't want to just be a messenger of doom and gloom here, but if you come to the breakout, there's lots of hope too in this message because I think our work is very clearly cut out for us and defined. We see fresh water declines everywhere. We see a resurgence of old diseases and the emergence of new diseases as we interfere with habitats, as climate changes, as we see less water, more drought, more water, less drought, whatever it is, depending on the part of the world you're in, the habitat is changed. And new species, whatever they are, will find a niche to settle there. And the human populations that have been settled in those areas for however long it is, have never been exposed to these new species. They will have no immunity to what these conditions are. So these are conditions of great concern to us in public health. We've seen increasing species extinctions globally, and we seem to be quite committed to and entrenched and have bought hook, line, and sinker from our governments and our neoclassical economists that growth is the only model that makes sense.